Good morning. This is Gary Greenswag. And uh, if you haven't figured out based on our background, we're here to talk about um, tests, screening, and cure for hepatitis C. Uh, this particular Grand Rounds has been in the making probably for almost a year um, as, as the team has built all the background information that you'll see today related to hepatitis C. So I'm going to turn this first over to Dr. McGinn and then to um, uh, Dr. Sagar. So, Tom. Thanks, Gary. I'm, as you said, very excited to, to listen to this Grand Rounds. This is a subject near and dear to my heart. You know, my early career was, you know, treating hepatitis C with interferon and, and trying to reduce, you know, the need for transplant uh, back in my, in the days of, uh, in, in East Harlem. But, um, so I'm really excited to hear about all the work that's happening here at Common Spirit. We have some really excellent speakers today. We have Dr. Justin Reynolds, the medical director of liver transplant at St. Joseph's in Phoenix and the chief of hepatology. Uh, we have Dr. Sarah K Syra Kadera, if I said it correctly, she'll correct me, assistant professor of surgery and medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, she's over at Baylor St. Luke's. Uh, she joined in 2013 after completing her transplant hepatology fellowship. Um, and next we have Dr. Aaron Sharp, who is uh, has a doctor in pharmacy. Uh, and she currently, she joined us in 2004. She has over 15 years of experience caring for patients. Um, and let me see what else I can. Aaron's specialty is retail pharmacy. Care focuses include patient access to medications, clinical outcomes, and high touch exceptional patient care. Last but not least, we have Dr. Ankita Sagar, who is our vice president for clinical standards, who's going to make a few comments to start us off. Ankita? Thank you, Dr. McGinn. Welcome, everybody. We are very excited to host this Grand Rounds. As you may recall, last year we had our version one of the Grand Rounds where we talked a lot about hep C screening. Um, but I'm going to preface what Dr. Reynolds, Dr. Kadri, and Dr. Sharp are going to talk about and give us a little background on hep C um, and why we're here to talk about it. So hep C is the most common chronic bloodborne pathogen in the U.S., um, approximately 1% of the U.S. population prevalence. And most recent data shows that about only 20 to 30% of those who are infected with hep C are aware. So there, it definitely is a lot of scope for improving our knowledge and screening. What's unfortunate is that um, when hep C, as you may know, um, can develop cirrhosis in patients, about 5 to 25%, and many of whom will go on to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. So while screening is important, treatment is equally, if not even more so important in a timely manner to really prevent morbidity and mortality. The beauty of hep C and the reason we're here to say we're going to cure hep C in our lifetime is because it is curable. And we are going to have both Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Kadri really focus on all the resources available to us within Common Spirit and how each of their teams, but also teams across the US within Common Spirit are working to make sure patients have access to treatment, including Dr. Sharp's clinical pharmacy team. And what I want to leave you with before I hand it off to Dr. Reynolds is to think about the fact that we have the three main aspects of care that we need to make hep C cured in our lifetime. We have availability of screening, it is affordable, it is feasible. We have the ability to connect our patients into treatment pathways, whether that's within primary care or beyond primary care. And third, we have our advocacy initiatives ongoing to address other structural barriers to make sure that access to care is no longer the reason, or barriers to access to care is no longer the reason why patients are not being treated timely. So with that, I will, lead the floor to Dr. Reynolds uh, to take it away and tell us a little bit more about hep C treatment. Thank you. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all. And I'm going to talk about uh, management of hepatitis C. And uh, I think part of the uh, emphasis on treatment in primary care, as was alluded to earlier, is that hepatitis C is imminently treatable and curable. And we expect to hopefully be able to do this in our lifetime. But um, I'm going to go through some of the tools that we have to treat 
I'm really not going to talk much about screening because there was a previous grand rounds that really addressed that well. Um, I'm going to really delve into a little bit of background, but primarily about uh, the treatment itself. So just a little bit of background, as Dr. Sagar just said, um, you know, hepatitis C is a virus that is an RNA virus, and there are six primary genotypes, but there are multiple subtypes beyond that. The genotypes are not really too important anymore, uh, not compared to how they used to be in the past when we had different treatments. And the estimates of prevalence are anywhere from a very conservative 2 million or so in America who are infected with this virus, as high as up to 5 million. And the vast majority of those individuals do not know that they're infected. Uh, most people with hepatitis C infection don't have any symptoms that they're aware of. Uh, but as was mentioned, if it goes untreated for a prolonged period of time, typically 10 years or several decades, it can progress into more advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, and eventually liver cancer. Um, there are known risk factors for transmission, uh, primarily transfusion. Uh, if, if one had received a blood transfusion before 1992, when we had the ability to screen the blood supply, this would put one at higher risk. Any history of intravenous drug use, even just one exposure, is enough to put one at risk. A co-infection with HIV or other viruses, being born to a mother who had hepatitis C at the time of her pregnancy, tattoos, especially unprofessional tattoos, um, high-risk sexual, sexual behavior. Any of these are considered risk factors, but many individuals who have hepatitis C do not have a known risk factor, hence the importance of, of universal screening. Um, it's important to note that the hepatitis C virus is different than other viruses, specifically like hepatitis B. It's not a virus that goes dormant. There's no such thing as inactive hepatitis C. And we don't feel that a low viral load confers protection or means that an individual is at low risk of progression. Similarly, having low liver enzymes or normal liver enzymes does not confer protection or imply that there's low risk of progression. Having the virus itself, it's really a, a binary thing. If you have it, you are at risk of progression. And if you have it, we should proceed to treating and trying to cure it. Hepatitis C, since it is an RNA virus, can be cured with antiviral therapy. It does not take up residence in your host genome. It can't integrate into your cells and, and again, be dormant and reactivate at some point. It's either present or it's absent. And our goal is to make it absent. There have been a number of treatments over the years, as Dr. McGinn alluded to. Hepatitis C was first named in 1989, and shortly after, uh, interferon was being used for treatment of it. But as you can see, the treatment cure rates were very, very poor in the, in the first few decades of its use. Um, at that time, interferon, eventually ribavirin, and later pegylated interferon were being used with success rates that were relatively poor overall and a very high side effect profile. Uh, this was a very difficult drug to use, and um, treatment duration oftentimes would last a year or longer, with success rates being less than a flip of a coin. Uh, so many individuals at that time were not being treated with the hope that newer and better drugs would come. Now, for the past 10 years, we've been in an era where we have really excellent drugs for the treatment of hepatitis C. Uh, we have really not used interferon in nearly a decade. We use ribavirin in sparing circumstances nowadays, but the vast majority of patients are able to be cured and treated, able to be treated and cured with all oral direct acting antiviral medications with cure rates of well over 90%, really 95% plus. Because of this really amazing transition and, and development of new drugs um, for the treatment of hepatitis C, Hep C elimination is within our grasp. And many government agencies and organizations, the CDC, the World Health Organization, have really made this a, a goal and a target to eliminate hepatitis C in our, in our lifetimes. The WHO has made it a target to eliminate by the year 2003, which some countries are actually on track to do. Um, the United States sadly is not, but as part of this white paper that was published last year, they specifically stated that eliminating hepatitis will require using simplified service delivery protocols and aim treatment towards lower level health facilities, including primary care, ideally with delivering testing and treatment at the same site to promote that linkage of care. And that's really why we're here, is to talk about how we can help to delivering hepatitis C treatment into the primary care realm, as opposed to in specialty care where it has resided for, for 
for so long. Um, so this is our guideline that we put together, our, our working group has put together over the past year, and it's available on the uh, Common Square Position Enterprise uh, Library website. Remember, uh, we can link to it, and if you see all of our QR codes in the background, it will link you to it. And this guideline was written um, uh, to, to, to educate and tell you essentially how to treat hepatitis C in a primary care setting for the vast majority of patients who are going to be appropriate for treatment in primary care. Um, what it will go through are individuals who are being targeted for a quote unquote simplified treatment algorithm. So these are individuals who have never before been treated for hepatitis C, who do not have co-infection with hepatitis B or HIV, who do not have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, who, who don't have liver cancer, who have not had a liver transplant. This guideline is really to address the bread and butter hepatitis C patient that is appropriate for treatment in primary care setting. And uh, in it, you'll find a number of algorithms um, such as this one that go through how we can go about guiding the primary care uh, physician or provider in how to decide whether or not it's appropriate to treat that patient in that setting. So initially, after a patient is screened for hepatitis C, uh, they will have an antibody test that is positive, and it's important to confirm that with a viral load test to document active viremia. But assuming that they are viremic, at that point, we should treat them. It's just a matter of where. And what the algorithm and what our guideline will go through is determining what additional testing is needed to be done and what steps need to be traversed to ensure that it's proper to treat them in primary care. But as I mentioned before, have they been previously treated for hepatitis C? If they have, then they should be referred for retreatment to a specialist. But if not, you can progress through it. Um, is there concurrent HIV infection or hepatitis B? If so, refer to a specialist. If not, you progress. And again, is there advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis? Assuming not, then they are potentially a candidate for being treated in primary care setting with one of these two drugs, either a daily dose of metabavir preventosphere or a daily dose of cefosbuvir delpatosphere, which we'll talk about on the next one of the next slides. So when we are deciding to treat those individuals, part of what will need to be done is a number of laboratory tests and we're currently in the process of working on order sets to encompass all of the tests that you'll need to order if you're interested in treating the patient. Those tests are going to include confirming, by, after you confirm viremia, a hepatitis C genotype, uh, screening for hepatitis uh, B, screening for hepatitis A immunity, uh, HIV testing, and then a basic set of liver enzymes, bilirubin, INR, CBC. Some of these are essentially to calculate uh, you know, how advanced one's liver fibrosis may be in the form of a FIB4 score, which I'm going to show on the next slide. Uh, but many of these are to establish essentially a baseline. Once you have these tests back, it will be important to calculate FIB4 tests to assess fibrosis in those individuals. And this is an important step because we want to ensure that in the primary care setting, that the patients who have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis are being referred to specialty for treatment because their treatment may be slightly different. Um, and one way to assess that is with something called a good four index, which you can easily calculate. There are a number of ways of assessing fibrosis. Um, there are serological tests, such as the fibro test or the fibro sure. There are imaging modalities like fibro scan or ultrasound based elastography. But the easiest and simplest thing that you can do in your own office without any real additional work is to calculate a fit form. And this is a non-proprietary lab, I'm sorry, a non-proprietary um, calculation, if you will, that if you Google it or put it into MDCalc, you'll find it. The four variables that are needed are the patient's age, their serum AST, their serum ALT, and their platelet count. If you have those four values and you put them into the calculator, it will spit out a score, such as the one listed here. And so long as that patient's FIB4 score falls below the threshold of 3.25, that patient is unlikely to have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis and would then be appropriate for treatment in the primary setting. Once you've decided that they are appropriate for being treated, you have these two primary options, Cabravir, Brentosphere, or GP, versus Sofosbuvir, Belpatosphere, which is Sofbel. 
And there's not any superiority data for one drug regimen versus the other. They each have cure rates in the high 90% range. There are subtle differences between the two. Um, in the GP regimen here on the left, those individuals can take three tablets of the medication once daily with a small bit or a meal, a small bit of food or a meal. The treatment duration is eight weeks, uh, but there are some drug-drug interactions that you have to be mindful of with this regimen. Um, with the soft bell regimen, it's one tablet, once daily, which can be taken with or without food for a 12-week duration with fewer drug-drug interactions overall. Um, again, our guideline talks about the two options. It doesn't push you to use one regimen or the other. There, are, there will be some patients where you may not have the option of using one regimen and you'll have to use the other. Um, for most of us who do a lot of hepatitis C treatment, we like to have experience in both because you will sometimes have to use each regimen. But both are well tolerated. The most common side effects are uh, mild headache, fatigue, sometimes nausea. Many patients have no side effects at all. Um, and I think that's especially important these days compared to regimens we had previously. When you decide which regimen to use, an important task will be to check that patient's medication list and ensure that there are no major drug-drug interactions. And the way that we typically do this in our practice is to use the University of Liverpool Hepatitis Drug Interactions website. Um, this is the link here. And when you go to that webpage, you can enter each of the antiviral drugs you're considering and then any medications from that patient's medication list. And it will populate a table for you determining you know, whether there are any relevant drug-drug interactions for each regimen you're considering. And if there are, what you need to do about it, whether it be a dose adjustment, whether a medication needs to be held uh, temporarily, or whether that drug is strictly contraindicated. Um, I will tell you in the beginning, uh, it takes a bit of work just to understand which which medications are um, are going to be interactions with the antiviral medications you're considering, but there are very few interactions overall. And once you've uh, treated a few individuals, you'll you'll get a feel for which drugs you have to be mindful of. But overall, uh, there are very few. And I think treatment is fairly straightforward and simple. On treatments, it's important that the patient is adherent and, and tries not to miss a dose if they can help it. Um, Beforehand, we always talk about the importance of good adherence. We talk about uh, the fact that we recommend abstinence from alcohol or other substances, which could be hard on liver function. It's not required that they're sober during treatment, and there's no data showing that active alcohol use during treatment uh, impairs cure rates or in any way reduces the likelihood of cure. Uh, but for good practice, we do recommend that individuals you know, be sober of alcohol or really reduce alcohol consumption uh, just again to limit further injury or harm to the liver. While on treatment, though, there is no routine lab surveillance that's necessary to do. Um, you may wish to, to check lab or check a viral load while on treatment, but it won't affect your treatment in any way. Um, you will still treat the patient for the full course of antiviral therapy um, throughout the full length of duration, whether it be the eight-week treatment or the 12-week treatment. And then after the patient has taken their final dose of medication, it will be important to check a viral load 12 weeks later. And that viral load 12 weeks later is to document whether or not the treatment was, was successful. It's important to check a viral load at that point, not a hepatitis C antibody. We expect the antibody test to be positive lifelong, but the viral load, if the treatment was successful, will be undetectable or negative at that point, indicating that they've achieved an SGR, sustained virologic response or cure. At that point, assuming they have been cured, no additional surveillance is needed. We don't need to check their viral loads later in the future because they're not at risk of reactivation, as I mentioned earlier. So in summary, um, once a patient has had confirmed viremia, we want to assess their readiness for treatment, their interest in treatment. We'll look for any evidence of viral co-infection, order the necessary labs to, to get insurance authorization for approval and, and dispensing of the medication. Uh, you'll need to calculate a FIB4 or do some sort of fibrosis assessment to ensure that that patient does not have cirrhosis, thus requiring them to be referred to specialty. You'll want to check for any potential drug-drug interactions before deciding which regimen to prescribe. And then after educating the patient on that med medication, they will proceed with treatments. Hopefully, they'll have a very smooth course, as most do. 
And once they've completed, we want to repeat a viral load 12 weeks later to verify that they have hopefully been cured um, and go from there. That is my final slide. So thank you. Uh, feel free to email me any questions. I'm going to pass it off to my, my colleague, Dr. Kadri, to talk about some of these. Justin, uh, this is Gary. There, there's one question in the chat, which is relevant to your talk. And so I thought maybe you might just want to speak to it. The question is, if the, if the cure rate is 95% plus across all types, do we still need to check genotypes? The great question. And uh, this is one of those scenarios where the theoretical answer to your question is no, we don't. But the practical answer is that from an insurance and payer standpoint, yes, we do. Um, oftentimes, insurance will still require a genotype in order to authorize treatment. But you're right. The um, the genotype has no has really has minimal bearing on which regimen we use. The only caveat being that in genotype three individuals, um, they are they have a slightly lower cure rate than the rest. And so um, our guideline, which follows the simplified algorithm put out by the Liver and Infectious Disease Societies, recommends that genotype three individuals be referred to specialty care. Aside from that, though, um, the genotype doesn't doesn't play as far as which treatment you can use. So I'm Sire Kadri. I'm a hepatologist in Houston, Texas. And as hepatologists, we take care of a lot of things, cirrhosis, liver cancer, transplant. But I can honestly say um, what I'm going to spend the next seven to 10 minutes talking about is the most important and my favorite part of my job. So this is a slide that you can see, it's from a paper published in 2008. We used to show it about 10 years ago. And it, it basically looks at the hep C viral replication targets for treatment. So back then when we used to show this slide, it, we would probably spend 10 minutes talking about the various different treatments that were available or were going to be available. And it was still even, let's say 2008, still a bit complicated. But as Dr. Reynolds mentioned, it is much, much, much more simplified now. Um, even as a hepatologist, there's really just three medications we use. And for the purpose of this group, it's gonna be the first two that Dr. Reynolds had mentioned, Softbell um, and Glucaprevir Preventisvir. So this man is Dr. Sanjeev Arora, and he's a hepatologist in New Mexico. And in the early 2000s, he was the only hepatologist in New Mexico. So if you were a patient who had hepatitis C, to get to Dr. Arora's clinic, the wait time was maybe four to six months. And because New Mexico is so rural, many of the patients would have to drive three, five hours just to get to his clinic. So what he found was the patients were getting to him too late. And many of the patients by the, by the time they got to his clinic already had cirrhosis or liver cancer. So in the early 2000s, he traveled throughout the state of New Mexico and recruited primary care, uh, primary care clinicians. So physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, and even pharmacists who were interested in treating hepatitis C. And this was back in the days of interferon on ribavirin, which was much more complex. And really the, the treatment was a lot more difficult, both for the person who was treating and obviously the patient as well. However, he recruited plenty of people and he would have a webcast where basically they would present their patients with hepatitis C, HIPAA compliant. Um, the patients weren't actually there and he would give guidance as how to treat. And in 2011, he published his work in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what they found was that patients who were treated in the primary care clinics had just as good an outcome as those that were treated in the university clinic with Dr. Aurora. So there was no difference. And you can see that the cure rates here are closer to 60% because again, this was interferon and ribavirin. So he showed that it, primary care definitely can, um, with some guidance, uh, treat hepatitis C. And it also built a sense of community among the providers. Um, many of these clinicians were, again, in rural areas. And um, when they participated in this program, they had that direct link to the academic center. Um, and so the program actually took off quite a, uh, really, really well. And it's been going on for about 20 years now. And although it started with hepatitis C, it, there are all these different disciplines, palliative care, autism, addiction behavior. Uh, and like I said, it, it's throughout the world. 
So the concept is pretty simple. Uh, people need access to specialty care for their complex health situations, but there aren't enough specialists to treat these people, especially in rural and underserved areas. So what ECHO does is it trains primary care clinicians to provide these specialty care services. And so the patients are able to go directly to their primary care clinic instead of having to travel to an academic center to get that care. And so it's not quite telemedicine. Um, when we think of telemedicine, we think of, for example, I'm seeing my patient on Zoom and you know, we're discussing different issues and treatment. Um, it can also be provider to provider. Uh, when I was in med school, we had we worked with the prison system, the TDC, and we there would be a nurse with the prisoner who would do all the physical exam and give us information. But ECHO is really telementoring. It's learning from each other. And I will be the first person to say that I feel like I learn much more from the, from the people that are participating than they actually do for me. It works both ways. And it's a force multiplier. So it, I'm one hepatologist, but I may have 10 different people logged on. And then those 10 different people will go on to treat several people in their clinic. So it's, it's quite efficient. And we always have case-based case -based presentations and there's always free CME provided. And it's actually the same CME that you use for this particular uh, meeting through Baylor. So I used to show this slide, I guess, pre-COVID and um, people used to really gasp at it and say, wow, this is really incredible. But this is probably what your screen looks like now. So uh, not so uh, awe-inspiring anymore. But again, the, the, it's just it's a, a meeting that's held over Zoom with the specialists in one center, in, in one place, and everybody else calling in. And the thing that's important to know is that some people are presenting patients, but others are there just to listen um, and to learn or even get the CME. So this is information with regard to our particular ECHO program. We've had about 60 partners really everywhere. We had someone once call in from Hawaii, but our regulars tend to be in Texas, South Carolina, um, and Louisiana. We've had over 2,500 case presentations. So we've been doing this for about nine and a half years. Um, and with our particular clinic, we have a lot of FQHCs that, are, that participate. So many of these patients are uninsured. So our clinic runs um, every second and fourth Monday of every month. It's 3.30 to 4.30, 4.30 Central Time. And like I said, there's always one hour of free CME included. The way that the submissions are done is there is a red cap link and it asks for basic information similar to what Dr. Reynolds had shown earlier. It's medical history, certain labs. We like to get the medications, um, social history. And usually it's a minimum amount of information that we need to give these recommendations. We like to have the cases the week before, uh, the Friday before clinic. And again, you don't have to present to participate. So if you're, if you're thinking about starting hepatitis C treatment or you have a case that you're not quite sure about, you are more than welcome to log on to our ECHO clinic to either present or just see how it's done. And I feel like people gain a lot of confidence even by just attending a few sessions. And of course, you are always able to ask questions and present your case. These are QR codes for registering for our clinic or to submit a case. And of course, um, I think these slides will probably be provided later. Uh, if you have any questions about our particular program, please feel free to email me at Kadri, it's just my last name, at bcm.edu. And I was very excited because we did have someone, um, I was telling the group, participate from Iowa, a nurse practitioner, a few weeks ago. And she just logged on and presented her case, and she did great. And we were able to give her recommendations. And so hopefully that patient will get treated soon um, in her clinic. And that is my last slide. Wonderful. And I think with that, um, Dr. Greensberg, should we move to the panel? I think that should. And um, we are going to, um, uh, Aaron, I know you're going to speak, but we're also going to um, invite uh, Dr. Jesse Singer from the Pop Health team just to uh, drop in with us. And so, Jesse, if you're out there somewhere, John, oh, there he is. Is going to beam you up. 
Let's see if he has the fancy background like us. But um, I know I feel so so obviously not welcome. <laughs> Jesse's been involved, uh, particularly in the data analytics um, for this project, as a, and particularly as it relates to our Medicare shared savings uh, claims data. And so we thought he may have some comments as we go along. But Ankit, I'll turn it back to you. Perfect. Thank you. I think um, this has been a great conversation, and we have a few questions in the panel. But before we go to those questions, I wanted to ask um, Dr. Sharp if you wanted to sort of introduce your team and all the all the wonderful work that your team does uh, for our sites across the board. Yeah, good uh, Good morning and afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Ann Sharp. I am the System Director of Retail Pharmacy Services under the Pharmacy Enterprise Group. Um, I oversee, and I have a couple slides, but I can just talk about it. Um, I oversee um, the specialty pharmacy program here at Common Spirit. We have um, one location in Phoenix, uh, which actually has the pleasure of working with the teams with Dr. Kaderi and, and Dr. Reynolds already. So we work with their hepatology uh, teams treating patients and helping them uh, ensure their patients are adherent and complete their therapies. We also have another specialty pharmacy up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and that the name of that pharmacy is uh, Madrona Health. So they focus mo mostly on um, that, that specific geographical area. Both pharmacies provide the same level of service. We have clinical pharmacists and uh, pharmacy technicians that either are integrated into the clinics themselves, or um, they work remotely to help these to help patients of, of not just Hep C but of multiple disease states. Uh, with Hep C, because the therapy is so short now, uh, most of the time it's just pharmacists that uh, are in contact with those patients, and um, they really what they do is they. Um, call the patients to make sure that they can keep track of side effects. And they do all the interim calls to make sure that they can help uh, patients answer questions. They talk directly to all the providers and the, and the uh, supportive staff right through the EMRs. Um, so, so that's what the team really does in a general sense. So that's where, that's where we come in. Thank you so much. Uh, what we can do is certainly as a follow-up to the Grand Rounds, we can share some of this information with folks um, and when we send out our recording in just a, a week or so. I want to come back to the question around genotype 3. I think it sparked a couple mm -hmm. of questions. So both Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Kadri, help us out. Um, why is there a concern around genotype 3? And what exactly are we looking for when we say these patients may be better served through a special subspecialty referral? So I can uh, address, well, I can try and address it and then um, feel free to chip in. But uh, genotype, so historically, genotype one has been the so-called difficult to treat genotype back in the interferon era. But with these yep. new antivirals that we now have, uh, genotype one is quite easy to treat. And geno three is the slightly more difficult to treat genotype. That being said, the cure rates are still well into the 90% range. But if you go through the guidelines that are put out by the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease and the Infectious Disease Societies of America, um, in some individuals who have more advanced fibrosis or who are cirrhotic and who are genotype 3, they have a slightly lower cure rate associated with that. And hence, um, there's some additional testing that's needed for those specific patients. Now, um, <clears throat> you know, ideally, those ones are, are the ones being referred over to specialty care because we're maybe more familiar with some of the uh, resistance testing that may, be, may need to be done in some of those instances. Um, but I will tell you that Geno3 comprises you know, around 10% or so of the total genotype um, distribution across America. So these are going to be uncommon patients that you'll, that you'll see. So I just, okay. I mean, if you don't mind me following up on that, I mean, I think it, and and, you know, sorry, certainly jump in. I, I think it's so fascinating. I mean, the interferon days, it was all about, you know, genotype one being the difficult. Now you have, but that was also in the low 20, 30% rate, I believe. And now you have genotype three, which is the difficult one, but thankfully it's only 10%. Um, do you mind if I ask a question? Am I, may I jump into your panel sure. discussion? I'm, and maybe I'll start with Syra on this one. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by the, you know, the process by which we get folks into primary care treatment. And, and a lot of that looks like let's, let's, let's remove those with complexity 
And I, and I think that's the exact right approach. You know, so if you have HIV or you're co-infected or you have some other, you know, fatty liver, and one of the things you talked about, you know, was the, you know, the Fib4, you know, not the Fab4, not the Beatles, by the way, in case you don't know the reference. Um, and what about the one is like, are we, can we automate that since it's lab values, right? That can automate, that can automatically come up in a, in a, in a, you know, in a clinical decision support tool, because it's all automated. And number two, what about the fiber scan? That was a certainly one, you know, is that not, do we need to do that? That was a big thing, you know, fiber scan, everybody. Um, so maybe, I don't know, sorry. Think, you know, yeah, what Dr. Reynolds was saying, really the FIB4 is the easiest to calculate and most of us already have that blood work and age. So that's definitely something that could be like a dot phrase and could be automated. The fiber scan, it just depends on availability. If, because I think you also mentioned the fiber scan as well. If you have it available, then sure you can have it scheduled and it, it will definitely assess for fibrosis. But really the FIB4 is so good at doing what it so it's, does. It's, you don't need to go there if that's normal. No, not, not unless positive, it's positive. Maybe you scan if it's positive. Is that the way? Yeah, I, I think if you were it? concerned that the FIB4 was leaning towards more fibrosis, then you could get the fibro scan. You know, the Mercedes type of imaging really these days is the MR elastography. But mm -hmm. if you if there was concern about advanced fibrosis, then a fiber scan is probably easier to get depending where you're on where you're at. Sorry. And, to, and to your point, the FIB4, you know, it is super easy to calculate. It takes 20 seconds to do, but some of the major labs are making it easier. They actually have you have the ability to order a FIB4 lab panel. Um, okay, that's what I was okay. Four, they example. just give you a score. Yeah, and it will calculate it for you. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't take much work to do, but it, it does make it easier. I mean, I would love to see it do that and then offer, an, the, you know, an order set attached to it that would say next steps automated for the doc. You know, that would make life easier for the APP. Thank you. Yeah, 100%. And I think um, to your point, I think those are discrete values that can be easily pulled into even tracking. Like, are we... Mm -hmm. doing the right thing by following the guidelines. Um, I wanted to turn to Dr. Singer and give him an opportunity to talk a little bit about how the population health team has been focusing on hep C and uh, all the work that they're doing to look at data and how we're actually performing when it comes to screening and treatment. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Jesse Singer on the on the Enterprise Pop Health team uh, under Dr. Stein, and and just really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share a little bit about what we're doing around Hep C. I would say it's taken two main paths for us. Um, one is on the data side, um, like everyone's mentioned, and and really in collaboration with everyone on this panel. So, um, so thank you. It's been really just fantastic and. And so, you know, we're taking a couple of different um, avenues here. One is using our all-payer value-based claims database. So these are all of our patients under value-based contracts. And right now it's a bit over a million um, patient lives. In a few months, it'll be a bit over 2 million. And so, um, so just so much potential there. And, and we're working to bring in clinical data to that as well. And, and just focusing on the care cascade here from screening to diagnosis to treatment. Um, also, you know, our, our IT colleagues are a big part of this as well. So that's that's one piece, you know, just just being able to support um, the clinical standards, variation reduction work um, from the data side. The second piece is, is, is the focus grant. Um, this is a grant from Gilead that we got starting in uh, 2019. Um, now we're at seven sites across four different states uh, in Common Spirit. And it's really focused on the ED and screening uh, for hepatitis C, HIV, and syphilis. Uh, and if positive, a navigator is notified, and they provide the first linkage to care. And that's kind of where, where the intervention ends. But, but today, we've done over 100,000 tests um, across uh, all of these disease states. And, and currently, we're working to centralize everything here. Since we just got our master agreement approved um, by Central Legal, um, which was not an easy path, but a very exciting path. And now we can really bring everything together and, and really leverage our size and our scale uh, and make things easier for the individual sites uh, in terms of EHR changes and centralizing the data reporting. So, so just, a, just a, brief, um, a brief update as to what we're doing, but, but really excited about this work going forward. Thanks. Thank you. And I think um, it, 
it dovetails so nicely into how we're thinking about both hotspots, places that have maybe a higher prevalence and a higher need um, versus across all of our primary care footprint. Um, so thank you, Dr. Singer. Uh, I know that we have two more questions about FibroScan. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to just summarize them and, and confirm. So when it comes to FIB4 calculation versus FibroScan, one question says, um, are there special consideration if there is a discordance in the estimated fibrosis between the FibroSure, which is a different test, and then a FIB4? And is that when you should use a FibroScan? If you could simplify it for us a little bit. Yeah, that's a good question. And unfortunately, this is something that comes up in hepatology clinical practice all the time, you know, where we get discordant values of fibrosis. And so uh, I think the short answer is absolutely. You certainly could use a fiber scan in a setting like that. Um, you know, APRI, the APRI score, which is an ASC to platelet ratio index, that's the acronym, um, is probably not quite as good of a fibrosis assessment as some of these other things that we're, that we're discussing. So um, to make it very clean, you know, what all of, the, what all of um, not only our guideline, but the societal guidelines recommend is, is good for for screening. I think if you just did that, you'd probably be just fine. Um, you know, most individuals, even if they are on the borderline of advanced fibrosis cirrhosis, are still going to be treated with the same regimen. So it's not going to make that big a difference. And that FIB4 is going to be quite good at discriminating for the patients with really advanced, you know, cirrhosis, like the individuals who are full-blown cirrhotic, um, you know, I think the FIB4 is not going to miss those people for the most part. So, um, but to answer your question, uh, I, I would use FIB4 to start with, but if you are unsure or have discordant results, I think fiber skin is totally appropriate in that setting. And like, Dr. Yeah, and like Dr. Reynolds was saying, most of it for patients, even if they had early cirrhosis, the treatment is the same, but I think it's important to get them into specialty care because they need follow-up for liver cancer and for progression, even if we do treat their hepatitis C. So it's not even that it would, the treatments would be different or primary care couldn't treat them. It's just that they need that link to specialty care anywhere, anyways, and then we can determine kind of how far along, how progressed they are. Can I follow up on that? Because, um, you know, so I think, you know, part of what we're doing is trying to ease the pass, the path into treatment. You know, we are identifying and, and then simplifying, you know, en entry into therapy. Uh, but then there's the other side of that equation, which is the follow-up, which you both have talked about. Can you help me understand? So if I'm FIB4 low and I'm being treated by primary care, what is my uh, hepatoma follow-up risk profile at that point? If I'm, you know, and, and you know, is is it, you may have mentioned this, I may have been, you know, I may have missed that. Can you just help understand that. I'm not talking about the ones that get referred off to specialty who have maybe an elevated FIB4 or maybe an abnormal, you know, early yeah. fibrosis, but those who appear to have no early fibrosis, they're going through treatment, pretty successful. Yep. What, is, and what are we doing? Really, there's almost no risk for Nothing. HCC. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What happens is the thing these days is people can have multiple liver diseases at the same time. So, you right. know, fatty liver is very common. So in those notes, you may have noticed that it says if someone has abnormal liver enzymes, those transaminases should normalize with hepatitis C treatment. And if mm. they don't, then there may be another component, something else um, mm. going on, whether it's fatty liver or another liver disease. But if their transaminase is normalized, they had no significant fibrosis, really there's no follow-up. I don't know if that, I'm guessing Dr. Reynolds agrees with me on that one. But it's, and so that's why it's so, it's so great to treat these patients before they get to that point, because yeah. you get rid of that risk of liver cancer. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the FIB4, that threshold that, that we cite in the protocol, um, it has a negative predictive value of, of over 90% for advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. So um, to your point, if if hepatitis C is really the only driving force of liver injury, if we've treated and cured that and we've eliminated the ongoing injury, there really shouldn't be risk of, of progression or, or any significant risk of HCC or cirrhosis mm -hmm. at that point. Um, unless they happen to fall into that less than 10% category where the test fails. But um, it, it, I think it is important to keep, uh, to recheck liver enzymes afterwards along with viral load, again, to ensure that there's not some ongoing injury 
Um, you know, although hepatitis C has been replaced as the number one cause for transplant in America, fatty liver is really behind it. Yeah. And, um, you know, more and more of the primary care guidelines and whatnot are recommending FIB4 as a, meaning, as a means of NASH and fatty liver uh, fibrosis assessment and screening as well. And so that's also part of the reason it was in that in, in this guideline to uh, to ensure that there's recognition of this test because I think we'll be hearing more and seeing more of it. Should never you should never mention negative predictive value in my presence because I'll start talking likelihood ratios. So I'll leave, but I'll leave that alone for now. So thank you. Great. Um, I'm going to just wear us a little bit more towards the discussion about you know the role of primary care, and I know Dr. Greensweig. And there's been two questions in the chat. Sure. One is around, you know, when primary care has so many things that we have to treat, annual wellness visit, depression, cancer screenings, hypertension, diabetes, how do we make all of this work and make sure that we're doing the best that we can for the patient? Yeah, it, um, it, and um, I, I think it's a great question. And as I thought about it, there's probably not just one answer, um, but there are a couple of things to keep in mind. And one is that I think we do the best in primary care and the best for primary care providers when they practice at the top of their license. And I think that there is um, sort of, as we look at efficiency, as we look at value-based care, and as we look at retaining primary care doctors to do what they like best, um, I think it's valuable for primary care doctors to add these skills, to use these skills, and to really uh, participate more in the sort of global care of the patient than just episodic care, like I've sprained my ankle or I have a sinus infection or whatever it may be. So that's part of the answer. I, I think the other answer is how we um, support them, how we digitalize this um, and, and how we make it work. And, and the last thing I would say is um, if we look at impact, um, one of the most impacted specialties, at least that I hear of, is gastroenterology. And um, uh, one could argue that um, if it takes six months to see a gastroenterologist, which is common in many of our markets, Justin, I don't know if it's like that in Phoenix or not, but if it is six months, then I think as a system, we need to address that and, and have the primary care providers help us. But uh, I would say decongest primary care doctors of things that they don't need to be doing, uh, support them better with more staff, um, uh, uh, partner better with advanced practice providers. And this really is, uh, we heard about the advanced practice provider who called into Project Echo. Uh, that person, I, I want to call them up and give them a hug. I, I think we need the advanced practice providers to do this with us. So I, I, I think it is a concern, but I think it's one that we should focus on addressing. Now, I was just gonna add a lot of, many of the way our, the people that participate in our echo clinics is they are their hepatitis C treater for that particular clinic or yes. area of clinics. And so many times, because the because it's so easy now and these patients are simplified, um, they may just get referrals from another clinician in the area and then they're the go-to person for hep C treatment. Because I agree, a, a lot of it's, you just keep adding on and on, but if someone has a particular interest in it, I think it could be done. Right, and as we're starting to talk to clinics, I think we're seeing that. And I just keep thinking, how many people am I gonna need to screen to find the one patient that I can launch this protocol on? And so to the extent we have, if you have a large practice of 20 primary care providers, even if they're in multiple sites, pick two or three of those folks, maybe two or three or who are newer in practice, have time, not as impacted, uh, get them trained up and skilled to do this and then have them be your internal primary care referral, referral source. I, I think that's a huge okay. opportunity. Yeah. And I, I just wanted... A, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, I okay. think that's a very common model as well, especially in the GI realm. I mean, most gastroenterologists, it's their APPs that are doing the hep C treatment in yeah. the office. It's not the physician themselves. Um, even in our practice, it's primarily our APPs who are doing hep C treatment. Um, the one other plug I will give to treatment in primary care and, and is that, um, and I'm sure Dr. Kadri can attest to this as well, I've had so many patients over the years who have known about their hepatitis C who have not come to hepatology clinic because of the stigma associated with it. You know, they don't want to come to a liver clinic. They don't want to sit in the waiting room. Um, they are frankly afraid of it. And so I think um, 
the, the treatment has become so simple. I mean, in the past, it was really a necessary thing, have them treated in a specialty clinic, but nowadays it, it, it really isn't. So anything we can do to uh, treat them in the environment in which they're already receiving care, just again, shortens that linkage, if you will, it gets more people treated. And I've had, you know, dozens of people who are cirrhotic, who I follow now, who had they been treated, you know, years earlier, mm -hmm. may not have advanced that far. So. Yeah. I wanted to tie this up nicely because I think um, this was mentioned earlier, right? That we are, we're not expecting our primary care teams to do this in a silo. Um, and I think we've mentioned a couple of models, whether that's a champion within specific sites, whether it's a group of folks in specific markets that want to take this on. But I think um, I want to plug two things. One is, of course, the, the wonderful work being done under um, our specialty pharmacy teams. You know, I think their resources have been very helpful um, to the multiple different sites that have used them. So kudos to, to you, Erin, for you and your team's amazing work, because taking off that admin administrative burden of the prior authorizations, following up the patients, making sure questions get answered, that's tremendous. The other aspect of this is um, we are working very closely with our informatics teams, alluding to uh, what we were discussing earlier on clinical decision support and order sets. So across Epic, Cerner, Allscripts, we are creating those pathways to be able to get those order sets right so that the first time you order things, they are done the way that you need them to be done. Um, and you have all the information to be able to make a decision. Dr. Kadri, I know you were going to um, add a little bit more context to No, no, I was just going to say, my doctor, uh, to add on, we're in the Texas Medical Center, which is a very scary place for patients to come to, and you have to drive into the Texas Medical Center, and you have to pay, I think, $12 or $15 for parking. It's insane. Um, patients like to be with their primary care uh, clinicians, and I, they just feel more comfortable. So as he was saying, more people are likely to be treated. Um, as well. And then I'll just answer quickly one question, Dr. Sagar, if that's okay. The, somebody had asked about why would you choose an eight week yeah. or a 12 week regimen? And most of the time that happens because of insurance. Um, one drug may be the preferred drug over the other. And I would say 90% of the time, that's what the issue is. Other times, again, there's not many drug drug interactions, but every now and then that does come up. And so that would be the other reason to use one drug over the other. Thank you so much. Okay, and I think we're going, we can continue talking about this and I know there's so many more questions that will come, um, but that's all the time we have for today. Dr. Greenswag, Dr. McGinn, any last remarks you would like to add before we wrap up? I would just say, Tom, I'll, you, you can have the last word, but I just want to thank our panelists, uh, mm -hmm. not just for today, but for months of planning and algorithm uh, teaching and all of the things. It's been a great partnership. It's a great partnership with our pharmacy folks, with the population health folks. And uh, and I want to thank Dr. Sagar for her leadership and Rachel, uh, who's on this call as well. I've just great work from all of you folks. So great, Tom. No, I'll just echo, no pun intended, what you just said. Um, and uh, I love seeing this sort of multidisciplinary, uh, you know, work, you know, we have, you know, again, pop health, you know, pharmacy leadership and, you know, hepatology and internal medicine, family medicine, APPs, and um, a real shout out to, you know, to Rachel Little and all her amazing work, working with uh, Ankita. Um, you know, I'll, you know, look, this is kind of personal for me. I did this work when I was, a, you know, you know, a young faculty member walking through the streets of Harlem, just frustrated that we weren't screening and curing patients. And, you know, to see us at the, you know, at the precipice of, you know, really thinking about curing this disease is so exciting. And, you know, I think it's kind of a, a big moment for Common Spirit to be in front of this and to say, we're going to tackle this problem, you know, just head on and do it in a multidisciplinary way, but really attack it. And I, I just, I'm just, you know, thrilled that we're, we're looking at this and taking it on. So, you know, I, I want to thank all the team members who are, who are excited because we're preventing, you know, a preventable disease and it's up to us to, to reduce any friction that patients would encounter getting into treatment. So, Thank you, thank you, and thank you.